welcome to this week's edition of A Sip of Knowledge with Marty Duffy, Liz Rhodes, and Lou Bryson, plus special guest this week, Todd Leopold of Leopold, Leopold Brothers, excuse me, out of Colorado, uh, who I will let your hosts give a more formal introduction to in just a moment. Real quick before we get started, I'm Will Hookinga from Savvy.co. Just want to give you a couple different ways to interact with your hosts and their guests throughout the presentation this afternoon. So to your right, you'll see a chat box. Feel free to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. I see several people already. Hey, Maggie. Uh, hey, Lisa. Andrew from California. Meredith. Christina Wolf. Great to see everyone today. Uh, if any of you guys have a question at any point during the presentation, there's a little button at the bottom that says ask a question. You can click that and submit a question in. I'll be keeping an eye on those and relaying them to your host throughout the presentation. Uh, last but not least, feel free to invite your friends to join us. There's a share button that makes it easy at the top to do that. Uh, but that's enough said from me. So, Marty, I will leave things to y'all now. Thank you, Will. You are a national treasure, starring Nicolas Cage. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Martin Duffy. I'm a former master, senior master of whiskey for Diageo for 14 glorious years. Uh, national brand ambassador for Benedictine. Hold down the applause. Um, That's cool. uh, six, eight, eight years as the. Uh, Dude, years. I went looking for a bottle of Benedictine today. I was going to hold it up. Oh, oh you should have. Could well, not find one. I still got the little mini. Hello. Um, <laughs> Uh, National Oz, I have for eight years uh, co producer of the Chicago Independent uh, Spirit Expo. And for the last six years, I've had the privilege of being the national, or actually the North American brand representative for Glen Karen Crystal, the one and only. Uh, do not accept imitations, especially if they say from China. Um, so, uh, with that said, Lizard. Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Seems like we've got a few familiar faces out in the crowd today, so welcome. Um, I'm Liz Rhodes, technical distiller and spirit consultant. Have just over a decade of experience in alcoholic beverage spanning across um, a couple different substrates, including beer, rum, vodka, um, but my personal favorite is whiskey. Um, I spent most of my career at Diageo, but I'm currently founder and principal at Spirit Safe Consulting. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more about what I have going on in the About the Host section, there's actually a link to my website, so check it out. And with that, over to Lou. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Liz Bre Lou Bryson. I'm a, a whiskey, uh, whiskey and beer writer. Um, I was the managing editor of Whiskey Advocate magazine for about 20 years. Um, I have a really hyperactive little corgi who's going nuts right now. Oh, that was the police. Trying no, to not. Your um, door. I also have um, this book, uh, oh my God. Class. That's my uh, my latest effort. Um, Read it not just this minute. It's amazing, isn't it? That's something else. Um, uh, Todd, you're, I, I don't know if you know, you're in there. Um, I do. Uh, uh, thank you. His guest, yeah, and, uh, and his uh, his magical three chambered still, which we're going to be talking about. And I don't want to wait any longer to get at that. So yeah. open it yeah. up. Uh, yeah, let's <laughs> yeah. rip here. So uh, yeah, uh, Todd, if you're reading this book, uh, page two sixty one is the best. <laughs> um, so yes, today, everyone, thank you all for joining us. Uh, today we have a man who is literally a journeyman. In a way, <laughs> not opposed to like a Bill Welter journeyman, an actual journeyman. The man has journeyed. He has studied uh, across countries and continents. Uh, I believe you studied here in Chicago at the Siegel Institute um, over in Germany. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Volt, everyone. And then um, uh, and has built a mythos around him. Uh, you know, well, it's a bit of a mecca to go there, and I had, I went there last October. Fantastic it is kind of a one stop shopping as far as learning all you need to know about distilling and from malting on through now. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Mr. Todd Leopold from Leopold Brothers Distilling. Hello, hi guys, thank you for having me on. 
crowds. Pull back the crowds. Yeah. The most reluctant celebrity in this. <laughs> 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 so Todd, Todd, you know, give us. I mean, your 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 bio is vast, and you would think, uh, and I think you've even uh, said this in the past that you're, uh, you know, a lot of people think, well, I've been around a long time. In a way, you have, mm-hmm. um, uh, and but it's really interesting that so many folks know about you and follow you um, uh, because your product isn't available everywhere. Uh, it isn't. <laughs> And yet, everyone knows about it, you know. Right. Um, so, uh, please give us a little uh, rundown, a little, a little mini bio of your sure. journey. And how'd you get into this business? Well, uh, my brother had just finished uh, getting his master's degree at Stanford in environmental engineering, and so this was, I guess, nineteen ninety three. And he was doing work for an engineering company where he would go in to Fortune 500 companies uh, and his, his, his mind make them pollution free. So he's the person to call when you're, um, you know, r- running a paper pulp mill or, or one of the places he went to was Crayola Crayons. I remember it because he horrified me and, st- you know, have all these wonderful, you figure, you know, bunny rabbits are making the crayons or something. And of course, uh, that's not the case. There at least <laughs> wasn't at the time. Um, kind of ruined Very my childhood industrial. a little bit there. Yeah. Yeah, um, Houston, who cares? Right. Exactly. Um, People are elves. People are elves. Too. Right. right. <laughs> so he was he was going to these companies with the idea of, of helping making them pollution free. So this was before anybody knew what the word sustainable meant. And uh, he got frustrated really quick because he, w- what was really going on is they just wanted this, this kid to get them EPA compliant and get the uh, hell out of my plant. So he got frustrated mm-hmm. and decided that he wanted to show people how to make a pollution-free factory. And at the time, I had just finished up my undergraduate degrees and was lost at sea. I was one of those people who went to college and was curious and wanted to learn, you know, just wanted to learn, didn't really think about getting a job, which is kind of a, a large point uh, of going to college, or at least it's supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be. It's it's supposed supposed to be. To be right? That's, that's no. old school. So. Yeah. <laughs> old school. Good one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so in any event, uh, um, I, I decided I'd always been in a beer and not in the, you know, ha-ha you know, <laughs> way, but... Um, you know, I was in the imports, I was into, you know, all these different beer styles and was, was kind of fascinated by it. And I came across a book by Eric Warner, Lou, I'm sure is familiar with the book, book on Hefeweizen and on the book jacket, it explains that he went to brewing school in Germany and I'd never heard of it. I'm like, wait, what? You can learn how to do this. You can learn a craft. I, you know, no, nobody. Uh, you know, at least not in our educational experience in public schools in Colorado, the idea of opening your own business was never really presented, you know, it wasn't a thought or, 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 you know, learning a trade. It was just, you know, do well on the SATs, get into the best college you can, and the rest will take care of itself. So in any, any event, I applied to the Siebel Institute um, and, and was lucky enough, somebody dropped out. Somebody dropped out of the class. Oh and me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, they, so I, I basically snuck in, and at the Siebel Institute in Chicago, so this was 1995, um, there were just a handful of small brewers there from uh, places like Full Sail and Old Dominion and the head brewer from Abita, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it, it, it was just a very fascinating time to be at the Siebel Institute, and the bulk of the brewers there um, were from the big boys. Um, so it was uh, um, Coors. Uh, Coors, their head of uh, head of lab services, was there p- touting mm. a PhD, and I'm 25 and just as dumb as a box of rocks. Um, <laughs> that that the corporate brewer from Molson sat t- on my left. Um, so he was the brewmaster in charge of all plants. And so these are all people with multiple degrees that, that basically Siebel Institute, at least at the time, was like an executive MBA program, right? Where you mm. came in on the grain side, or you came in on the seller or packaging or whatever. And they were trying to groom you to be able to move across, um, you know, different production areas. That's really how it was kind of structured. And to top it off, half of the course was on malting. 
it's not like that anymore. So we're sitting in there, you know, week two, week three, we're still talking about barley. We're still talking about malt and, and, you know, uh, you know, how drying works and Molly air diagrams and all of this crazy stuff. And some of the younger idiots like me, um, you know, kind of sort of complained to Bill Siebel and said, when the hell are we going to get the beer? We don't know anything about anything. <laughs> and, he, and he was just, you, you, shut up, you idiot. You, you need to understand how to make malt if you want to make beer. Where it all starts. <laughs> yeah. Richard's grasshopper. Well, so, awesome. <laughs> so in any event, it, 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 I got a wonderful foundation of malting, which would serve me, uh, you know, a couple decades later. Um, but in any event, graduated from there. One of the lecturers was the dean at the time at Domans, which is a brewing school just outside of Munich. Um, and I was very interested in lager production and making Hefeweizen, as I mentioned before, because of Eric Warner's ex, uh, inspiration. So I went over there. Um, now it's a joint program, <laughs> but 95, I was the first one to go to Siebel and then Domans. Uh, Oh, but it, oh, it cool. was a, yeah, it was just a curiosity thing. And I think, you know, oh. maybe, yeah, maybe I set a template unwillingly. I don't know. But in any event, um, so I went there and then I went to, uh, I was in a class with uh, Johannes Bart, who's the Bart Hops, if you're familiar yeah. with Bart Hops. But um, so he was my age uh, sitting in the class. And then uh, another gentleman named Leupold von Fink. And I learned that the word von usually means very, very old money. He's the, first, he's the first billionaire I ever met, and I had no idea that he was a billionaire and then also what that meant. But the reason I'm telling you this is that when I got done, the two of them said, well, what breweries do you want to work in? We, we can get you in anywhere you want to work. Um, so I, I, I worked in wow. several breweries, several small. Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, I really wanted to go to work at Augustiner, but I was at least smart enough to know back then that that was pointless. <laughs> Because the plant, the, the, the plant was so big and I was going to work in such mm -hmm. a small plant, you know, I, I needed to start where I was going to get filthy and understand, you know, pumps and fittings and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And of course, it didn't do me any good because they're all German din fittings. But anyway, and, um, <laughs> so I worked in breweries and then I came back to Ann Arbor and we opened up a brew pub in 99. The reason we did that, open up there instead of Colorado where we grew up is... Um, the, we did market research as, as well as we could. And back then, there were 14 breweries in Denver uh, Metro, and we concluded the market was saturated, which, of course, everybody and laughs that, when you say that now. Yeah, how many? Yeah, how many are, are there, there now? Uh, there's, well, I know there's over 400 in the state now, and I'm sure it's got to be 100 yeah. in Denver Metro at least, wow. if not more. Um, but I, we were right. Uh, Lou knows that there was a bust that happened in the 90s. Yeah. Um, so we. That's we, why we became a whiskey magazine. Yeah. We were a beer magazine. Yeah, that's you, exactly what happened. You got it. So, mm -hmm. so we went to Ann Arbor because it wasn't a brewery at the time. Opened up shop there in 99. We were designed as a tasting room. And as you all know, liquor laws are weird in every state. And we were technically a tasting room. And we could not sell Jesus Pennsylvania, right? Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, we could do like 10 Better shows. than it was. Better yeah. than it was. At, right? And the same thing in Michigan. Actually, they changed the laws when we left and a couple of distillers sent us notes <laughs> with a kind of sorry mate kind of a – in yeah. any event. So we opened up and we were we were right. We only uh, we only made beer. We made unfiltered German-style lagers, which as you can imagine was wildly popular. And, yes, I'm being facetious. Um, and I was making, I was making Keller beer. I wasn't making what people expect from off the shelf macro. Yeah. He's laughing right, for sorry. good reason. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right to laugh. And I was stubborn. What'd you call yourself? The determined to fail brewery? The, you got it. The, the, the dumbass younger brother oh brewery is what it was. So I was the guy who, and I only did it for a month to my credit, refused to have lemons with my Hefeweizen. <laughs> that dumb where it's like no i work so hard to get these flavors course, out of there. you know after a month i'm like what do i, I work do? hard to get this money i don't want to spend it right right and after you know after 30 days of that i realized you know people can shampoo their dogs as long as they pay for the damn beer what do i do <laughs> So, um, but in any event, but because we, at, at the time beer is nowhere near as big as it's, you know, the boom hadn't really hit and uh, it wasn't very, uh, you know, popular. We became the place that you'd start your net night or end your night. It was a big oh, wow. 
German style picnic tables. And we were just yeah. having a big gap where were we dead. So the only thing we could do was that we knew we had to add spirits. And the only way we could do that was to get into distilling. So I went to uh, Alltech, um, mm. uh, had a distilling school for a bit there. And what was fascinating, and you'll love this, Lou, I show up and the half of the damn staff from Siebel was there. <laughs> Chris Bird was there, Dwightkowski was there, uh, Anna McLeod was there. It was pretty fascinating. And the bulk of the, the folks were there. You know, it was about a class of about 100 people. Most of them were making um, uh, fuel grade ethanol, mm. right? So a lot of the lectures were to that, which was interesting. Um, uh, but this there were rum. Nice choice there. of word. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, but the wonderful thing was there, there were four rum distillers there and they were trying to solve the problem of uh, molasses having less, less and less sugar in it every year. And they were, mm -hmm. they were oh, going yeah. to try to learn. It's a waste stream. Yeah. Right. right. It was. Yeah. So the sugar got more efficient. They were losing, you know, actual fermentable right, sugars right. in their molasses and they were trying to figure it out. And of course, you know, one of them was making, uh, you know, high ester rum. Hmm. So, you know, like most of these experiences in classes, you learn more in the bars and the restaurants afterwards. <laughs> you, you learn to, hey, you want to go have lunch? You, I want to hear about your story. I want you never know what you're going to learn from all these wonderful, wonderful uh, people. So uh, after that, I'm taking too long. I'm sorry. So we started. So we opened up um, in 2001. We started distillation. So we were one of the I don't know if we were the or one of the first distillery pubs in the country. And so we'd have five, six different kinds of, un, you know, unfiltered Schwarz beer, unfiltered, uh, you know, lawn beer essentially is what we were making, you know. Um, and the hops that we got were from Bart hops. And I don't know if you know this, Lou, but in Germany at the time, at least, I don't know what the deal is now, but they, they don't blend hops. They sell by regions. So, oh. so the hops were unusual. So Spalter Select from Hollertau was different from the Herzberger region, blah, blah, blah. So I guess yeah. what I'm trying to say is, I made our beer even more unusual. <laughs> it went over like a lead balloon, but um, so we, we pulled a wine. Yeah, yeah, nowadays, that's that's. I mean, it's not the yeah. hot thing, but it's a hot thing. Yeah, that's well, being done. Stay ahead. Be, be, being ahead of the curve isn't all it's. Crazy. That's not fun. No. no. Um, so we we pulled a winemaking license. I, I we bought the bulk wine, and I made sweet vermouth and dry vermouth because I thought you needed to make martinis. Because I was an idiot, um, and uh, and that, and that was based on Michigan liquor laws, right? That you have to make everything yeah. internally to that's be able true to serve for most it. Distilleries, though, I, think, I don't know if that's true in Colorado as well. It, right now, um, in Colorado, they they passed a, a distillery pub license two three years ago okay. now, so now you can have a liquor law. It's you know, it's it, it's still true different. in Illinois. Yeah, so so it was kind of a necessity as a mother invention thing. So yeah. it, it's a roundabout way of explaining why we make so many different things. I was populating a back bar, and, and at the time, people didn't really care about whiskey, and we didn't have the money. And the way that Michigan laws work, we couldn't sell the whiskey on site. If we could have sold the whiskey on site, you guys would be drinking, you know, ten and fifteen year old expressions. <laughs> we would have never left Ann Arbor. But they wouldn't let us sell it on site, and of course, it's wholesalers controlling the conversation and yeah. being afraid that they're going to lose their cut instead of trying to grow the pie. Yeah. Um, the, the, the the attitude back then was, you know, they want it all, so they prefer to stifle these kinds of things instead of encourage these things and, and increase the, you know, the the bottom line for everybody. That's not how they looked at it. So that that's how we got our got going, um, and then somebody bought our beautiful building in two thousand and seven. So we moved back to Colorado we, at the time. So the 08 crash happened and the thought mm -hmm. of selling gin in uh, a recession slash depression in Michigan <laughs> sound very smart. So we sent out my assistant early. He set up shop um, with a little new store unit as our warehouse and started <laughs> distribution in Colorado for six months so that when we made the transition, we had revenue the whole time. Right. And we moved into just a little used store unit. And then, uh, you know, our biggest customers at the time were in London and San Francisco. Those were the only places that had serious cocktail programs. So that's where we were selling. We never sold our spirits in Michigan, by the way. Um, and wow. you, just, just at the so bar. you were just, 
selling sorry you were just selling gin at the time or did you do we did gin and, we did gin and vodka there. the coffee liqueur our, our cherry liqueur our blackberry liqueur that we still have um yeah was, uh, and the only stuff you were selling in michigan was by the drink there at the yeah, pub by the ounce you're right wow. yeah. we had, well we had bottles to go okay we couldn't give them away <laughs> We could not give them away. They did. They nobody wow. understood it. They thought, "Wait, you mean like bathtub gin?" And you know, so so it, it, it's why when the younger distillers kind of come to our place, you know, as it is now, and you know, say how you know lucky we are, and we are lucky. I'm not saying that, but I'm like, dude, you weren't there <laughs> at the start when we're trying to. Oh my God. You know, I, I had this kid uh, come in. He said, "You know, I've traveled to Europe." which is always a great prelude to any conversation yes. uh, and said, your, By the gin, way. your gin is bum piss. Oh, yeah. Wow. And I don't know if you guys, that doesn't even make sense. Cause bum piss. Yeah. That doesn't even kind of, that's two <laughs> separate little areas. Just well, the fact funny check. thing too is I'm not exactly a small guy. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> and I thought that's an unusual choice for a conversation, and it's like I just kind of okay. I got a pump running in the back, you know. I'll I'll see. You know, you, you have to take the slings and arrows, and you know, it's wow, like, it's, well, Tom, uh, that's brutal. Tom, yeah. when you were making spirits in Michigan, mm -hmm. did you find a big difference once you moved to Colorado? Uh, with I know you were making whiskey. Uh, were your spirits a whole different class of bum in Colorado? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> Much yes. higher kind of, they're kind of bum new. Completely yeah, accurate. No, I was, I was really I concerned also. about that. Yeah, I was concerned about that, and so I did all kinds of. I, I trained myself and and um, took different cuts of our gin, for example, um, before we moved uh, to make sure that when I fired it up, that my sense memory wasn't. You know, I wasn't looking back a year and a half ago or whatever, however long it took us yeah. to get the still set up. Um, and yeah, the boiling point is a little bit lower here, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, it, the, the diff, the time it takes to come to boil um, really doesn't make much of a difference. I've, we have a steam heated uh, boil uh, still and it is uh, just, it's 150 liters. So there really wasn't any difference. Mm. The flavors weren't different. I was scared to death. I'm like, Oh God, I have to redo everything. And uh, I, I can't, uh, I, I could not tell the difference. So, but that's a good question. Wow. Um, anyway, so I guess to finish it up. So then the show Mad Men came out, um, oh. which is kind of a nice bookend, I think, because, you know, James Bond, because men are stupid, we thought we could be James Bond if we drank the shaken, not stirred thing. Wow. And that kind of marked the end of Brown Spirits. The last distilleries in Pennsylvania and Maryland shut down. Right, white spirits took off. Oh, Hiding yeah. the flavor of alcohol took off. America went boring basically across the board for food and drink for a good twenty years. Right, um, and the, the resurgence with Mad Men. Suddenly, we were after nobody caring about anything that we do outside of some pockets, like I said in London and San Francisco. Um, suddenly, everybody was interested, and our, our sales kind of took off. And Scott and I had to decide: all right, are we going to be super tiny, or are we going to get a little bit bigger? And so that led us to the building I'm in now, that we built uh, about six years ago. And the only uh, set of uh, requirements, I, I guess I said, or, or stipulation that I set on my brother, he went to Northwestern for econ. So as you can imagine, he does all the finances. And was that we would build the building based on our current sales. So the, the one thing I know about from being in the beer industry is the worst thing you can do is chase after volume for volume's sake. Yep. You, end up, you end up chasing your tail. I always say it's, uh, and you guys should all understand, you know, that cocaine ad from the, uh, from the 80s. On the anti cocaine ad. Oh, the anti. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I think you they started mixing the actual ad for cocaine. <laughs> you, do, that you do cocaine to work harder and you work harder so you can do more cocaine. You know, it's kind of that same oh. tre treadmill that you get <laughs> in. Yeah. yeah. And, and so we, we never want to get on that treadmill where, where you have to be chasing after to, to make sure that that nut is being paid for. So we're really um, financially conservative as a result. But that brought us here. We added the floor malting at that time, so we had a smaller malt floor. Um, again, finally putting the Siebel and Domans uh, trained me on malting as well. Um, 
to get that going. And, and we've made about a half million pounds a year. That takes care of our needs for, for vodka and the whiskeys. We use 20% in everything we make. And we have so many great brewing partners. We've worked with New Belgium for over a decade now with our barrels and some other fun things that we've done. And every time brewers, Odell, and the rest of them would come and visit, they would say, hey, can we have some of this malt? We had to, no. to, say, had to keep saying no. And then finally, <laughs> we, finally, we decided to say yes. So now we have uh, uh, the malt floor. Um, and feel free to bring up pictures, if you'd like, uh, uh, on that. Of the, There's one that says uh, upper floor and lower floor, I think, um, that shows our malting. So now we're casting. Um, 10 metric tons on the floor at a time, which to us <laughs> seems enormous and to the large malt house is still a joke. <laughs> um, we, we've had a wonderful relationship with Coors, as a matter of fact. Um, oh, cool. come out, they've been absolutely wonderful. And, you know, they find it fascinating because they want to know they have a beautiful vertical malt house where everything just goes, moves down a floor, moves down a floor, which is, of course, disco because gravity doesn't break, right? Um, or hasn't yet, maybe 2020 is the year, uh, but um, it, it, it's, uh, it's, so now we're able, we're just finally starting to work with a, a national wholesaler called Brewer Supply Group that really supplies every brewery in the country. Um, so our malt will start going to all four corners here in the next year, oh, wow. I think, when we get through winter and also Canada, uh, believe it or not. So, oh, cool. Uh, Todd, it's been a fun that, trip. Will, Will, can you bring up the picture of the pagoda? Um, and while yeah. he's doing that, uh, Lee said, we're a classy set of bums here in Colorado. <laughs> yeah, but how's your piss? <laughs> oh, that's the important thing. Yeah. I, I want This is like an aside back to our well, pit liquor conversation. <laughs> are, you there, <laughs> are you familiar with this, Todd? Pit liquor? Oh my God. No. Pit, it's just. Apparently, Liz, this going to be my favorite question of the entire series <laughs> since the spring. Are you familiar with pit liquor? <laughs> it's apparently a, a Colorado-based startup that they're using. Their whole shtick is using um, vodka and whiskey as a natural uh, deodorant. <laughs> we must have missed that phone call. Yeah. <laughs> There's a shame. What is bourbon soaps? Why not a bourbon deodorant? Well, the one thing I am happy about when, when pot was legalized, every wannabe entrepreneur came out of the woodwork wanting us to do you know, weed vodka or, or you know marijuana whiskey or, or whatever. And we're trying to explain to them, I don't think you understand how this works. Oh, there we go. Yeah. There's our, there's our <laughs> malt pagoda. So, so that... Yeah, Todd, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, we were talking earlier and you do a lot of research uh, for almost everything. You really go into a lot of detail as far as uh, uh, your research and history. Uh, explain uh, to folks what this is for those who aren't familiar with you know, uh, scotch malting uh, um, uh, floors. So that's a, the very top that you see is a malt pagoda and it's kind of um, you know ubiquitous with, with scotch distilleries when they were all do, making their own malt. Um, so the basic idea was it was designed by a gentleman by the name of Doig, D-O-I-G, and it, it's basically a cube. And inside that cube, several feet down, you've got basically, those who are familiar with beer, louder tongue plates, so slotted stainless steel grate. You put the malt at a pit site. You, usually it's under a foot for the older kilns. We, we go as high as about two and a half, three feet, a little bit deeper. Um, and then underneath it. So what you're doing is you're, you're uh, drying the malt. We're kind of skipping ahead here, but in the malt. You're, you're, the sorry, you're talking about the depth of the bed there? The I'm talking about the depth, depth of the bed. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a yeah. little bit taller for us, and it's usually a little bit thin. It, it's like everything in this business, right? It depends on the shop. Um, mm -hmm. But basically what that is, you've germinated the barley, so you let it sit on the floor for several days as the uh, – the, um, Embryo is uh, breaking down the starches into simple sugars that it can consume and turn into rootlets. Basically, the malting process, you're growing a malt plant, you're growing a barley plant on your floor and then stopping that process before it goes too far. And the way this, that, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this just gas forced air or could yeah, you we, do uh, yeah. 
repeated, you know, smoked malt if you could? Are you we, set up for that? We will not do that. And the reason we won't do that is once you get phenols in that kiln, that's the end of the game. Um, the, the, the smoke. Everything will taste like smoke. And we may have one or two really thrilled customers, but then the rest would hate us. <laughs> um, because it goes, the malt goes into our vodka, it goes into our bourbon, it goes into our rye. Uh, into mm, a pretty much rye. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, see, there's the one. Lou, I'm sure in. there's a market somewhere, at least five people. Well, Lou, if you would pay about a uh, half million dollars a bottle, we could probably <laughs> make that work. <laughs> and then it would, yeah, okay, well, Lou, it makes Lou happy. Let's throw smoke in there. So, are you are you malting barley and rye? Uh, that we, we will be kind of playing around, but right now we're just on barley. So we, we, we literally just started. Um, we just did our commissioning this year. We're just putting the malt in the sacks. Um, Will, if you want to switch over to the one mark steep, um, we'll start the process and then we'll end here. It'll make a help. There you go. So the beginning of the process of malting, um, your, your uh, barley's a seed, as I'm sure most of you know. The easy way to kind of think of it is like popcorn, the flinty end of the piece of popcorn before it pops. That's the embryo, the white uh, part that turns into the fluff when you pop it. That's the food reserve for that embryo to get food so that it can grow rootlets and eventually get, uh, get its energy from the earth right? So the malting process starts by steeping it in nice cool water, usually for about 48 hours. The moisture content starts at hopefully somewhere, you know, around 10, 12% um, coming out of the field. And then you're going to steep it in that cool water to get the moisture content somewhere between 43 and yeah, 48%, I guess would be the highest you'd want to go. And at that point it thinks, okay, I'm in the ground. And just like yeast can't consume sugars, uh, the embryo can't con or can't consume starches. Um, the embryo can't consume starches. So what does it do? It takes protein, synthesizes them into enzymes, and those enzymes break down the starches um, and turns it into energy and also rootlets and an acrospire at the top part of the plant. So we'll unload that cone at the bottom. We'll pitch the entire floor. If you want to go to, I think it says upper floor, Will. Um, we'll, we'll pitch it out onto the floor. And what's happening is it's generating heat. Um, nope, that's, uh, nope, <laughs> well, we're getting there. Nope. Nope. We got one more. Is Did I not one? send it? I don't think you sent it. I suck. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> this is why they don't let me out of the distillery. Right? Should we interpret <laughs> that's all right. what you're describing? Right. Yes. Well, I think like everybody's a, seen, most of the people who have tuned in have seen floor malt before. Let's yeah, just it's like a carpet of malt. That's how I like to think of it. Something I'd like to roll yeah. around in. Okay, so in, it, so in any event, you spread it out on the floor. It germinates for several days. It generates heat. You're raking it to make sure the rootlets don't go together. We'll pop it into, um, into the kiln to stop the process the same way you started it. You started it by adding water. You're going to pull that water out with warm air. Depending on the kind of malt you're making, you'll go all the way up. We, we make a pale malt that we actually kiln off at 220 degrees because what the hell is the point in making malt if we're not going to make it a little bit different? So it's got a little bit more flavor and color than you get in other pale malts. But in any event, your question about the peat, when you're putting that green barley in on that perforated screen, that's where you're putting the smoke through. If you're spring bank or the frog or whatever, you're burning peat underneath. The malt is in the 40% range. So that wet, wet, what's called green malt at that point is going to suck up and absorb all of that smoke flavor. And that's, what's going to make their, uh, their whiskey. So that's the Doig kiln is basically a design left over from the 1800s that most uh, distilleries back then would use to dry their malt. Now they'll use drums to dry it or, um, you know, different, more automated systems. This is just an old school way. We have to fill it by hand, level it by hand, empty it mm. by hand. It's a lot more um, uh, energy and labor intensive, but it's an awful lot of fun. Boy, do we, we enjoy it. It's so much fun. And it lets us get the exact flavors that we're looking for. It gives us another lever to pull. And, um, you know, most importantly uh, to us anyways, for our fermentation, which leads us to the three chamber, because I'm talking too long about this stuff. Um, what we do in our fermentation, we, we pitch our yeast. We ferment very, very cold. We ferment in the 60s. 
And we allow for a secondary bacterial fermentation to occur in our fermenters. Our open fermenters are set out next to windows. We've got peach trees, crab apple trees, lavender wow. roses outside, and the building is designed so this window that's to the actually pointed the right way. How about that? <laughs> yeah, um, that's amazing. I was at the sink. <laughs> everything's converted, right? Um, but just outside this window right here, I'm sitting in the tasting room that's adjacent to where the fermenters are. We've got lavender and roses and things, and our these windows are designed to be the air intake, which is the opposite mm -hmm. of breweries, distilleries, sausage plants, where it's filtered air in and a positive pressure out wow. because you're trying mm -hmm. to keep bacteria from getting in the building. For us, we designed the building so that the air intake that where our fermenters sit, it draws the air in uh, in the building and across the fermenters and up out the top. And the reason we're doing that is we're trying to populate the wooden fermenters as the decades roll by with bacteria mm. and wild yeast that will consume things that the yeast can't. That gives off organic acids. And when you have organic acids in your whiskey barrel, over time, oxygen will work its way into that barrel combined with those organic ester, uh, acids to create esters. So this is a long-winded way of saying, since we moved to this plant with all of these changes, we made whiskey at an old, old plant about four blocks away from here. Um, we're starting to get a house note of a compound called oxaloacetate, which tastes like orange marmalade. So all of this stuff that we're doing is trying to get a house note. And we've been here for, I guess, six years. We're, we're trying to find our whiskey. You know, what, mm. what are all these different things? So. So to, that's to something. To, I'm sorry. I just want to. I'm no, almost done. I promise. That's okay. So I the was floor just saying. That we made, Go ahead. Uh, so the Liz, floor Liz, let him finish. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and then I'll shut up. I promise. So, um, so the so the floor malt malt, if you don't know or the viewers don't know, is is rife with lactobacillus. And they're all different varieties. Some of them are homo fermentative, which means they'll only produce lactic acid when they consume something and some will make acetic acid. So the types of lactic acids that you have in that malt matters for your whiskey because for us, that octal acetate that you mentioned, you're not gonna get it without acetic acid and quite a bit of it. So the type of lactic acid that we have in our malt, because of course we're mashing it, we're pumping it into the fermenters, and the warmest temperature it's in is the 140. So the lactobacillus that's sitting in that malt hasn't been killed the way it is in beer where you boil it, right? So where you get your malt, matters if you change it and you're aging your whiskey for four eight especially mm. for the scotch producers a few parts per million of, of organic acids over time if you're letting it age for 10 15 years there's your house note that's what makes your whiskey taste like your whiskey so that's what we're trying to do here liz i'm sorry please go ahead yeah that's liz. okay no <laughs> i forgot what i was gonna ask yeah I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. i knew it <laughs> it's okay um but i i just you know, I think there is the, the conversation of terroir can be very polarizing, um, yeah. which I, I know we've had this conversation yeah. many times. <laughs> um, but I'm yeah, I'm a big proponent of the micro terroir. So I I'm was very excited just listening to you mm -hmm. talk about that as being a key element in the whiskey making process in terms of a flavor. So, um, I, you know, again, like, I think it's it's a huge piece and it sounds like you you guys have definitely factored that in to, to try and pinpoint, you know, what that finger, fingerprint looks like for you guys. Correct. So it, it, it's, you know, it, it's not an easy thing to do. So in other words, we so we're pitching yeast. So the three chambers still that you got, that's four different yeast strains that we're using to, to make it. So it's taking the starting gravity of 12 and a half Plato, 12 and a half percent sugar. It ferments it out in 72 hours, just like everybody else. And then this we is let a, it- This is a blended strain? This is a blended strain. Okay. So we, we use a dry and three liquid. Okay. So, so, but when that's done, we let it sit for an extra 48 hours to the point <laughs> where there's literally what, what brewers would call floor. It's basically- um, you can see the lactobacillus little spindles on the top doing its thing. The pH drops down into the twos. So we're really pushing it. But you can't go you can't go too far because if you do, as Liz knows, you can create acrolein and other problems. Um, that, that's called the, the slang is the peppers, and it's not red peppers or, or good peppers. It's pepper spray. Acrolein. <laughs> so oh, wow. if you get acrolein in your fermenters and it gets in the still and you bring it to a boil, you'll have to evacuate the plant because everybody oh, will start crying. So it's a controlled fermentation. It's harder than it sounds. Liz, I'm sorry. That's okay. I know I was saying I've never personally experienced acrolein, but I've I've 
certainly heard the horror stories. <laughs> I've gotten a few younger stillers that have wow. called me up saying, what the hell is this? And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> the devil. <laughs> yeah. I've experienced pepper spray a few times. Yeah. Or does that count? Right, yeah. Yeah, actually. Noted. <laughs> Um, Why am so, I not surprised? So anyway, so that's the fermentation. Let's get to the three chamber still. So yes. this is, you guys are the first. So this is uh, cask strength. So this now, um, you know, Will, if you want to show that uh, one of the two, the one mark thumper is probably the best one. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned a paper when we were kind of get, you know, getting everything started. Mm. Um, ignore the guy, focus on the copper mm. thing in the back. But take um, looks take familiar. Take of those overalls. <laughs> right. right. Overalls. <laughs> so that's a piece of equipment that I came across in a paper that was commissioned by the IRS. And as I like to say, never say the IRS didn't do anything for us. <laughs> it, it, it was in the late 1800s and they were, it was before the Bottled and Bond Act and they were trying to, it was basically trying to figure out what makes whiskey whiskey, right? What, what would eventually be the standards of identity and where things like the no age statements after four years came from. It started from this paper. Uh, and, and, uh, they did a survey of 33 different distilleries, about half made bourbon, about half made rye. And I came across this paper more than 10 years ago. And it said for the rye distillers, it said, okay, you know, what was your grist? You know, how much of, of each, you know, corn, rye, barley, if it was bourbon, rye and barley, if it was rye, how much of each was it? How big was it? Was the warehouse heated? What was their entry proof? Um, and what kind of still did they use? Every single one of the rye producers, except for one, used the three chamber still. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't just some um, gimmick or contraption. This was the tool of choice. And once I saw that, so I started asking why. I started trying to find drawings. I came across some cocktail napkin drawings. We did not come across engineering drawings. Um, when we, we contacted Vendome and Vendome looked in their library, they didn't have anything. And they actually wow. acquired wow. another still manufacturer and they didn't have anything. Uh, so uh, basically I said, okay, well, here it is. So by the time I got to Vendome, I had understood how it worked. Uh, it was described as heavy bodied whiskey back in those days. And it was describing it as getting a lot of oils in it. And so once I saw it, I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. I understand how it works and, and why it works. I begged my brother um, to let me, as you can imagine, that thing is 20 feet tall and all copper. Um, so that was more than a buck oh five. Um, and, and the only one of its kind? The only one of its kind. There is uh, one other now. So the, uh, the uh, uh, nice. uh, where? Um, well, it, it, it's, in, it's uh, down in Jamaica. So, uh, you know, Will would be interested in that. Um, Maison Ferran acquired a, a distillery down oh, there that, right, has a right. that has a chamber still. So now that's, he's using it for rum. Um, at the time I spoke with him and because of COVID, I don't know what the hell year it is or when I talked with him a year ago, two years ago, he hadn't, he hadn't even turned it on yet. So this mm. is the only one that's operating that's being used for rye whiskey. And um, basically, the, the, it's hard to describe how it works with, without being here for two hours. But suffice it to say, it is designed to extract maximum oil. So your typical column still, I'm going to do this explanation. You've got the mash entering. This is a beer stripper into the column. It's going to come into the side of the column. The column is going to be you know, two, three, four, depending on the size of the still wide. It's going to come in the top. And it's basically going to descend like a set of stairs. The mash is. And live steam is going to be injected from the bottom to strip out the alcohol, congeners, and flavors on the way to condenser. I'm simplifying. The design parameter for a column still from entry to exit. Yes, this I've ever heard it happen. That's great. Right. <laughs> that, well, I'm trying to make sure I don't. Interpretive dance. Years. Right. <laughs> exactly. So fr from entry to exit, it's 90 seconds. It's the design parameter. Okay. So for this still, it's in each one of those chambers for 90 minutes by the time it, it's done. Most of the distillers are, are controlling the temperature at the hottest point. That's how they're controlling the still and how much flavor it, they're, they're changing the proof by the temperature that they have that bottom chamber, right? So usually it's around 198 degrees. Um, for this and the three chamber still, it's north of 220 degrees for two reasons. One, it's got about 10, with those three chambers that are filled with rye uh, mash in each one of them, that's quite a bit of pressure on it. So the pressure is higher in that bottom chamber. The bottom chamber um, almost has no alcohol. So let me explain it as quickly as I can um, without having uh, drawings, which we'll be getting to the public at some other time here in the next couple months. But the way that it works is pretend we've been running the thing all day. 
So you've got one chamber on wait, top. Wait, of wait, 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 one second. Sorry. Can we pour the whiskey in the glass so we can oh, smell God, it while yes. you're talking? Yes. Yes. I thought we already did that. Yes. I thought we already did that. specific instructions, yeah. Todd. So I, yeah. we were yeah. all just waiting. The only <laughs> thing I, I ask is keep nosing it. Keep nosing okay. it a couple minutes before you take a sip. And, and Todd, you mentioned it was cast strength, but you were doing a little bit lower entry we're, proof, correct? We're in at 50%, and that's something that I picked up from the Crampton and Tolman paper. Every single American distillery was their entry proof was 50 or 50.5 back then. All of them, 100%. Nobody was going any higher. That was the way that they were making it back then. And this is how long? That's so, over. That's about four years and, I don't know, three, four months, something like that. And you were saying the other day that you lose, what, about 4%? 4.1% a year right now. And it comes out at the same strength that it goes in. So that's 50% and that's mm. strength. Okay? So uh, Yes, thank you. Okay, so to explain the still, so you've got one you've got one pot on top of another, one still on top of the other, and there's a contraption in the two stills on top that's basically just a um, a, J, a J pipe so that as long as you have the mash that's below that J pipe, it's going to allow the steam from the bottom chamber to bubble up through that mash without that mash falling down into the lower chamber. Okay, nice and simple. So we have shut off. We have pulled heads, hearts, and tails out of it. This will all make sense when I get to the end, I promise. So you shut the steam off. The bottom chamber, the mash that is in there, no longer has alcohol in it, so that pumped out the stillage. You take the mash that's in the chamber above it, move it down one. The mash that's above that chamber down, move it down one. Um, and then the mash out of a preheater that all that does is takes it from the, the beer well that's at room temperature. And mm -hmm. it, the vapor path is directed through a heat exchanger so that this is almost at boil and you enter it into the product path into the still. So you've got three chambers. Each one of them is going to have alcohol. The one that's in the bottom almost has no alcohol in it at all. The one that's in the middle, just to make the conversation, you have half of the alcohol removed from it. And the one that you just put in the top has the full 5% alcohol that we have put on the fermenter. We're going to introduce steam in. That steam is going to bubble up through all three chambers, run through a thumper, ignore the thumper for now, and we'll hit the condenser. And when I turn that steam on, we'll get distillate in about two minutes. We'll take your, your head cut, your four shots, just like you would in any other distillery where you're doing the demisting test and checking for clarity and make sure that you're not having separation. At that point, you're collecting your heart cut. That's what's gonna get cut with water and put into barrels. Uh, just like with, with any other pot distillation, when the flavors start to taste unfocused and get tailsy, um, we're, we're gonna collect tails. The tails are gonna be collected um, and this entire process, the head, hearts, and tails is about 20, 30 minutes long. So as I mentioned, instead of 90 seconds, each one of those mashes, by the time it runs through each of the three chambers, starts on the top, moves down one, moves down one. It's got 90 minutes of heat treatment. That bottom chamber is almost rye water. And it's also under pressure. So what does that mean? It means that the temperature is going to be much, much higher than in another still and it's going to extract compounds that are soluble in water mm. instead of alcohol, which means mm -hmm. you're going to pull a ton of oil out. So you're probably going to notice an awful lot mm -hmm. of legs. If you're kind of turning the glass around, you're noticing the legs are ridiculous. Yeah. So when this is coming off of the spirit safe, it's so rich in oils that it'll cast in meniscus that's a centimeter uh, plus high. It's crazy. Even, if, even though it's at 70% alcohol, and as we all know, alcohol is thinner, has a lower surface tension than water. So normally it's flat as hell, right? This actually throws a meniscus. This is why it was called heavy bodied whiskey. This is why so, so many of the distillers liked it. It's an oil extraction machine, which you're also going to notice. And if you want to add a splash of water, go ahead. It is going to release an awful lot of aromas and top yeah. notes where the still is behaving a lot more like perfume or a gin Bourbon and, and most whiskeys, for you, as you know, for the most part, the aromas are pretty flat. You really got to get your nose in there. This one, if you put a splash of water in it and leave the room and come back, it's room filling kind of the way that absinthe is a little bit. And, of course, we make absinthe here, too. Um, so we're putting it down at 50 percent. We're putting it in a number four char. Um, we're in a dunnage style warehouse, which means earthen floors. So our building that we store our, our whiskey in. Um, Will, you can bring that picture up if you'd like. That has earthen floors and it's surrounded. I'm just, it's, it's just across the way here. 
Um, it's surrounded by very good irrigation and some drip irrigation on the perimeter of the building so that we're getting moisture to seep up into the earth mm. below um, the, the actual Dunnage warehouse. And what that's doing is it's making it about 20%, 20, 25% more relative humidity in that warehouse. And that's important because we're in Colorado. Colorado's dry. Um, people who've had Garrison, Garrison Brothers or, or uh, you know, places like that where you know the evaporation rates in the double digits because it's so hot and dry, right? There's no water in the air to kind of slow that angel share. This was me trying to slow that angel share so that we didn't have double digits. And I actually um, got a handshake from my brother. And those of you who have engineers in your family or know them know that doesn't happen very often. Um, <laughs> I thought that we were going to reduce it. You know, I would be, I would have been happy with 10% but it actually dropped it all the way down to 4.1 per year. So oh, cool. it's, it's yeah. slowing the evaporation rate. And another neat side benefit, as I mentioned, the proof doesn't change. I don't know of another warehouse in the world where the proof doesn't change. Right. Um, this is unique to our place. Yeah. And part of it, of course, is this is Colorado. It's an unheated warehouse. So really nothing happens in January and February outside of esterification. It's not really extracting. It's not really evaporation. And I think that really is a is a big reason why but that long, to, just a, a quick please. follow up um going back to uh fermentation mm -hmm. i meant to ask you then and i got sidetracked <laughs> are the orchards intentional they're absolutely intentional you wanted them for what was going to grow in those trees okay uh, we let the fruit fall to rot okay so we're we're, really? we're, tr we're we're trying to we're trying to see what it is we can do um so that my six-year-old daughter hopefully if we can talk her into it um you know, runs the plant, she'll have some pretty neat fermenters. We've got wooden fermenters now that are, um, some of them are about 10 years old. And, and mm. over time, you're going to get the, the, we don't steam them. Okay, we, I was about to ask that. <laughs> yeah, we, we rinse them out and we clean them. So it's not like you look in them and you're like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> yeah. we're, so it, it is visually clean on the inside of the fermenters before we refill them. So oh it's not gnarly or anything like that. But you know, over time, the bacteria that lives in there and that we're getting from the malt is going to mutate and contribute to flavors as we're letting this whiskey sit longer and longer. How long is that warehouse, Todd? Oh, God, I could have told I you mean, that I, before. I, I mean, I remember seeing it, and I know it's... it's a. I think it's about two, 200, 250 feet, something like that. Yeah, it's yeah. almost uh, two-thirds the size of a football field. Then. Yeah. yeah. And how many barrels do you have laying down right now? Oh, over 2,000 now, which to us seem, seems like a lot, but <laughs> we, we, we always enjoy having the larger distillers out and, and, you know, kind of, they're so polite to us. They really are. <laughs> They were, that's they, a, they that's really a good number of uh, barrels for a uh, oh, yeah. distillery. Well, well listen. The, There's lots for just 200. And it's the part we're, we're proudest of when, when, when you know, some of the larger companies came around and were kicking the co tires to see if we were for sale. To, say, to stay mm. independent and to put this much whiskey down and to uh, purchase that chamber still, you know, out of what it is we were doing. Um, we're very proud of it. It's very, very hard to do um, and, and to age it for a meaningful amount of time. Um, it, it, nobody's throwing it out. How is it? You guys like it? Oh, it's <laughs> great. The, I it mean, is. the body, the, 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 the viscosity you were talking about, Yeah. very, I mean, it's still clinging to my tongue. And yeah. there's, I pick up like cardamom and cinnamon dust, uh, cedar, little candle wax. This is Almost anything that starts with C. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing, so, my, so my favorite part about it is, uh, I'm sure after you've tasted it and, and smelled it, it, there's nothing else like it. So you don't have to understand the rest of what I'm talking about to know no. that this is different, that this is not a gimmick. You know, what, what, yeah. what I had to you know, worry about when we bought it and we first ran the still, and I told Scott what I thought. To me, the biggest thing that I get is linalool. So to me, it's lavender, and that lavender shows up in the nose and in the finish. Mm -hmm. I get flowers. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I knew this still would do before we fired it up. And I turned it on on a Saturday so that I could just focus on what the hell I was doing and get used to the scary noises that you've never heard before. And um, Oh, my God, yes. It must sound completely different. Oh, yeah. Everything about it's different. It's, it, it, very it's manual. Under, seems oh, like. God, yeah. No, you cannot <laughs> leave the still. It, the, the joke we have is uh, – so it, it, 
I'm running this still. I do the late shift and Craig uh, shows up and fires it up at 530 in the morning and he's a worker. Oh, he wow. likes to move. He likes to, he hates the still because he has to sit. And so what I did was I got him a Netflix subscription oh my God. <laughs> and said, binge, enjoy your shows. You have to sit still until I get there and then you can go do whatever it is you need to do. Um, but yeah, you're, you're making changes every 10 or 15 minutes. It's a very visceral still. You, you really feel the operation of it, the amount of steam yeah. that you're adding. There are things that are under vacuum that you think is under pressure, things that are under pressure that you think are under vacuum. Um, and yeah, I, I can't. There's I, no, know, I'm sorry. no equilibrium point, right? Either because you no. think of column stills, continuous stills, you think equilibrium is the biggest you know Correct. point of activity still i wonder if that's where they came up the saying sit still because you're just <laughs> sitting and watching the still the bad I mean, dad, gonna... the bad dad pun that somebody shared with me and i don't remember who did it was net netflix and still so, wow yeah. you should put that pretty on bad. a t-shirt right it's pretty, uh, it's pretty <laughs> that's, that's pretty bad pun netflix and um, still. but um uh, but you're the the nice thing about it. So I ran so I ran the still for the first time. I told my brother what it would do. Happily, it did. That meniscus came out. I jumped for joy. The lavender notes came out. I jumped for joy. Um, and and then, uh, I called him up and said, "Hey, you know, it's running great. It's doing everything. It's totally different from anything I've ever made before." Scott, being an engineer, paused on the phone and and said, "Well, wait, is it too different?" And I said, "I gotta go. You can't give me five minutes." And, <laughs> of, hey, we really have something here. <laughs> and it took a lot of patience because, of course, you know, after the first year in the barrel, it's a train wreck because the flavors are so busy that you could ordinarily perceive some of the notes as tails, but they weren't. It's simply because the finish is so big that you need time to let those barrel sugars to come out right. to help balance it out. The esters start to come up so that it tastes balanced. And this last summer, um, just came out absolutely beautiful. I was thrilled. It, it was an entirely different whiskey in January than what you have in front of you. That's what some of your, oh, I was just going to build on that, uh, your, your tailsy comments. Cause I, I definitely, I, the first big thing is it, it's changed literally every time I've gone back to <laughs> appraise yeah. it. Um, so it's, it's an interesting journey um, since early speaking, but from your comment about the, the tails notes, like I definitely get the the grain character, um, and I normally yeah would associate sort of like a, a grainy like a wet grain almost cardboard as a tailsy kind of note, um, but that's yeah. it's a definitely different modality. Um, yeah. It's more of yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah, I totally get to, what you're. That's exactly it. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. You, you have to re you have to retrain, or I did anyways. Have to retrain the way what what you're thinking about the cut points are. Um, because, you know, the cut points are, are, are rather high, actually, um, you know, relative to, um, you know, r r running a running a pot still. It's 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 the it's the rye water that I mentioned. It's pulling so much of those of those compounds out. You know, the white the white dog is certainly interesting. But if I you know, I I had to trust my judgment that as I was tasting it, I'm like, oh, God, do I have to move those cuts higher? And I you know just kept sampling. And of course, I also pulled some where the cuts were. Um, you know, a, a little bit further along and my judgment said, no, it, it, it's, it, it's actually a little bit higher than is reported. There are some conversations in some of the engineering um, books that I came across that discussed it where they said what the cut point was, but you oh. know, these are all moving targets because, you know, the starting alcohol, is, it, you know, can be a little bit different. So if you're putting in 6% alcohol, it's going to change where that cut is. It's going to cut and the raw material. Exactly. So the raw material, which I didn't really, you know, touch on, yeah. we, we had a bruisey rye grown for us for this project specifically. So bruisey rye was, was something that I kept coming across as I'm going through this research, uh, favored by distilleries in Pennsylvania and Maryland. And there was some discussion uh, on, online I saw about rosin rye and some other varieties. Mm -hmm. so bruisey was the other one that was that kept being mentioned. It's very low in starch. So most modern rye is pushing 80% dry basis starch. We've been breeding the flavor out of our grains, not just in America, but in Britain and, and in Germany all of these years. Mm -hmm. And of course, I didn't think about it. You know, when Starch I is calories. Calories is value. Yeah, no, exactly. It's great if you want to feed the world. Yeah. But, but, but if you're looking for flavor, mm -hmm. 
you're breeding the flavor out. So what I look for in our, and when I'm looking at heirloom grains, I look for lower starch. And when I see lower starch, I'm like, okay, well, what, what's replacing that? So a few of the things in any bruisey rye, rye will have anywhere between 0.3 and 4% oils. Oil content, a bruisey is pushing that. It's in the four. So oh. that, 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 are, you know, that, that's why I'm like, okay, yes, that's the one that I want. We're making heavy bodied whiskey. I want as much oil in there as I can get. The other thing it has is elevated levels of linalool and Lul, Lou has been a part of this conversation as elevated levels of ferulic acid. Ferulic acid is the building block when you're making hafevites and for the clove flavor and the way that you're trained to um, uh, control the amount of spiciness when you're making hafevites on one is your mashing temperature. So if you use lower, lower temperatures, you can release some of the bound ferulic acid. And the other, of course, is you use, simply use more wheat. Okay. So what a lot of people don't know is, is that um, the major distilling strains that are out there uh, are hefeweizen strains, what, what they call in brewing parlance, uh, puff positive, phenolic off flavor mm -hmm. positive. But you don't get that spiciness that you get in a lot of single malt simply because you're not adding the critical component, which is the ferulic acid. Right, most barley varieties don't have a lot of it, but I've run into a few people who say that they tasted. Uh, I don't want to name names because I don't want to be wrong. Um, tasted a major, uh, a major distillery in Scotland's White Dog and got that. Oh my God! I swear I taste four VG in it. The the spice note, you can get it, yeah. but it's a question of the barley and the malt that you use, your mashing temperatures, yeah. yada yada. So anyway, so this has elevated amounts of that, and the biggest thing, the, the easy thing to understand is. As a brewer, when you're making a recipe to make a 5% beer, you're not weighing out pounds of, of grain, you're weighing out pounds of starch. And because the, the uh, Abruzzi rye is 60% versus 80, almost 80% starch, in order to get that 5% alcohol beer, I have to add 20% more of this Abruzzi rye than if I used a modern strain. So I'm putting more flavor in it right out of the gate uh, by selecting this rye. So now we have several hundred thousand pounds being grown for us down the road in Longmont by farmers that are used to dealing with cores. So again, back to these massive contributions that large producers have made to the American brewing and distilling scene, they're not really getting any credit for it, but because they've been working with core specifications for growing for nitrogen and moisture and you know all, all of that kind of thing, we have world-class farming here. So yeah. all, I, all I have to do is not screw up the work that they did um, uh, as, as best as I can. And build um, on it, yeah. So that's so. This is eighty percent of bruisey rye and twenty percent of our own floor malt. Uh, talking about the uh, evolution of the aroma as we're sitting here, I mean, when I when I first poured it, I was getting a lot of fruit with the grain. Um, kind of reminded me of my uh, my wife does oatmeal for breakfast and always has varieties of dried fruit in it. Um, and then it evolved uh, to more spices coming out, um, and now. <laughs> this is a weird <laughs> observation. It smells like my next door neighbor's house from when I was growing up, which really makes me wonder about what the hell is going on in that house. <laughs> but this is, I mean, remember this from a kid. This is what it smelled like when I walked in their door. Oh, that's great. I get dark chocolate. It's starting to get a very dark chocolate, powdered chocolate. Yeah. Yeah. Almost like the, the over 70% stuff. The stuff where it's not it's not sweet anymore. Oh, right, 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 right. Dark chocolate. Right. Okay. Yeah. Dark chocolate. I mean, really. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I describe it as cocoa nibs. Cocoa. Yeah. Um, um, but I, I'm see. This is where this is kind of fun for me, of course, because just because I taste something and I know something, and I'm like, oh my god, the layers, the. The, there was one point wow. before the summer where it where it smelled like I was dropping. Uh, there was so much nougat in it, it like uh, three <laughs> musketeers bars into it. There, it is unbelievably layered. It is unbelievably complex, and it's because that. But so it's three separate distillation streams combined into one. So normally, if yeah. you make a, a water distillation, an easy way to to look at it, if you go to if viewers go to YouTube and look up uh, lavender distillation. They'll take you to France and they have a copper still that they literally open the top off of it, pack it all the way to the top with lavender, put the head on that goes to a condenser, and then they pump steam into it. So again, water is the carrier. The temperature is higher because that steam, right? Mm. So not the 200s or, or the low 200s or in the case of the column still 198. 
it's going to be carrying aromas that you're not normally going to get. The problem with this approach, of course, as you guys know, it's not very stable, right? So those top notes that you're getting are absolutely beautiful, but they'll fade over time. With the three chamber still, the bottom chamber is making a water distillation. The middle chamber is doing a half water and half alcohol distillation. And the top one is doing an alcohol distillation and is stabilizing all of those things. Wow. So that's and that why changes. It's so weird. Yeah, and I was just gonna mention that changes the volatility. Different compounds have different volatilities at you different ABVs. So I could see how that kind yeah. of compounds as you go. You got it. And all the temperatures are different in each one of the three chambers. And it, it's just, it's an amazing contraption. And in, and in my mind, I, I was hoping that one of the larger uh, players would come in and we'd revive the style. Um, but after running it for five, almost five years now, I, I have a hard time trying to picture. Um, Freddie No came out to have a look at it mm -hmm. um, a, a couple of years ago. And we were laughing, trying to picture what the hell it would look like if Jim Beam <laughs> wanted to make how big, how many stills, how big, it, you know, it would need to be um, in, in order to make. So, you know, we're just making a few barrels a day um, in, in that relatively large looking still that you see. Do you think it would be a, a larger still or a bunch of smaller ones? Sorry. Uh, if you put me in charge of it, which I wouldn't necessarily. It would be a bunch of that, smaller ones, wouldn't it? I would do a bunch of smaller ones. <laughs> Uh, so that what's you can the, make, make different things. I'm sorry, Liz. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what's the diameter of your, your stuff? Oh, I should be able to tell you off the top of my head, but it's about five feet. Okay. It's, a, it's about five feet. Yeah. Well, Todd, as I was going to say, um, the, uh, the uh, big guys are really slow on the uptake, though. Uh, I mean, it takes them. I they mean, want to look at it. You don't see certain trends happening. And right. then, you know, it could be 10 years later and all of a sudden they go, ah, look what we're coming out with. Oh. Well, they, they, the one thing I did learn from talking to some of the folks about acquisitions and again, it just what we, you know, we never got to, we didn't want to waste anybody's time and say thanks, but that's, that's yeah. not our, that's not our path. When you're making that much whiskey or that much beer, it's almost like they're making and selling vacuum cleaners and we're making and selling oranges the businesses and the business models, they're just, di they're just different. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, they're, they're just different. And I don't envy them their jobs. I don't know how the hell you forecast and. Uh, oh, forecasting's know. nuts. Yeah, yeah. We have a hard enough well, time doing it at our size. I don't they know can't. how the hell they do they it. They can't. Yeah. I mean, right. yeah. you look at, you look at the history of whiskey and how many dips they've had uh, throughout the, uh, the last hundred so years, you know, it's, they can't. And, yeah. and so many other things can be thrown into it, especially you look at Irish whiskey and just yep. geopolitics comes into well, play. And that, Next thing you know, that touches on what we were talking about beforehand and the importance of sourcing. And, and you know, I, I finally got a chan chance with, uh, you know, Lou on the line that I'm, you know, such a fan of his, of his uh, posts on beer and, and the, the getting rid of, there you go, getting rid of the word, you know, craft, and, you know, understanding that these larger producers, while, right, while the business side of things, as I mentioned, is vacuum cleaners and oranges, when it yeah. comes to production and when it comes to art, um, I, I can't tell you how many journalists, when they started down, you know, that Daily Beast article that kind of spawned it all. Oh, that, my God, yes. That, yeah, that came out. And then our phone was ringing off the hook. We didn't appear in many articles because they weren't getting the quotes that they were looking for. Um, hmm. because I would say, you know, if, if, you know, what, what the nose are doing and, and, you know, what Harlan Wheatley is doing at Buffalo Trace isn't art and isn't craft. What the hell, what? <laughs> That's just the, Thank you. Dumb, the dumbest thing I have ever oh, yeah. heard. And they, they kept trying to put, because we're small and independent, they think that I've got, I don't know what they, what the hell it is. They think that I do. <laughs> Uh, that, that the other that those distillers aren't doing and of course most of them are using liquid yeast and, and you know un, un, understand that a lot of the smaller companies just just use dry and just mm -hmm. handling yeast and maintaining your own yeast strain and how hard it is and quality control and how do you make Jim Beam taste the same from decade to decade and how difficult it is and then I could go on and on about all the inventions that they've had in single barrel and somebody had to come up with all of this crap and instead of looking at 
you know, at Leopold Brothers as just a small little link in, in the chain, we wouldn't be doing any of this stuff if it wasn't for the larger producers. So I'm kind of get, it gets tiring, you know, watching everybody trying to slag them off <laughs> as if they're not cool. So they'll, you know, so when I travel, so for the most part, I'm drinking my own stuff or, or, or beer, but when I travel, I get, you know, uh, Buffalo trace just gone on United airlines. Mm. Huh. What a glorious whiskey that is four, four year old. They're, they're regular, Bourbon is yep. glorious. I feel the same way about Jim Beam. That the, they're beautiful to me. It's like a, a banana custard, isoamyl acetate. That's what I. It's beautiful. And then the same thing, um, you know, with brown formant spirits. These are beautiful, oh, yeah. beautiful yeah. whiskeys. And w when people try and slag that off and then yeah. you know prop us up, I'm like, dude, you don't. You know, the thing is, though, I don't. I don't see a lot of distillers doing it. No, it's usually, and it's yeah. like that, you know that. It's like that in beer, yeah. too. What ends yeah. up happening is experienced once, Mike. you and got experienced and, once, well. and marketing, and, and the marketing yeah. folks get in and, and think yep. that saying bad things is the way to get ahead. And that, you know, there aren't many ways to get fired at our place, but saying something <laughs> bad about another distillery in my yeah. presence is a good well, way to get It's amazing. Fired. The way people feel about whiskey and think about it, a lot of it is due to what they've learned through marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, when single malt scotches were just really coming on, all of a sudden people be, uh, said, oh, I moved away from blends and really moved up to single malts. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I had to rem I remind them, you know, these single malts, they weren't even in this country <laughs> uh, for the most part uh, until the 80s, most of them. It's and then before that, most of those distilleries wouldn't have existed and it's maintained. A, you got it. It's a different place. style. It's like the same conversation. You know, we're in Coors Country, Coors Banquet. So I had a local be be before I had a daughter. I had a local that my wife and I would hang out called Steubens on 17th Street. And the bartenders knew that when I could get out of there, and I'm usually exhausted when I would get there, they'd have a can of Coors Banquet waiting for me. It's a beautiful beer. Yeah. It's a different style of beer. Not everything has to be, you know, and, and, you know, we're kind of fighting the same thing. So, for instance, so the bourbon, I didn't send out the bourbon, and I guess I, this is why I'm not in marketing. That's all right. You send our it, addresses. Right. Good point. <laughs> so the bourbon that we make it has a very high percentage of uh, malt, as I mentioned, 20%. Oh, wow. So as a result, it's going to have a lot of features that are similar to an Irish whiskey because it's distiller's malt and it's not kiln at a high temperature, so it tastes grainy. That's not where, you know, the, the Kentucky bourbons are. The Kentucky bourbons are made by fermenting warmer, pushing those esters, and to me, they have, with the exception of Jim Beam, massive, massive isobutyl acetate, which tastes like raspberries. If you taste my whiskey, you're not going to get that face full of raspberries that you are and Buffalo Trace and some of those other beautiful whiskeys, it's a different style. What do consumers end up doing? Oh, well, this is crap. This doesn't taste like Kentucky bourbon. And I, you know, but the nice thing is, and the reason Lou, Lou is preaching to the choir here, brewers, <laughs> had, preach, uh, brewers had to go through that same thing. Oh, yeah. Right, where, hey, this doesn't taste like Bass Ale. Sierra Nevada doesn't taste like Bass Ale. You, you're not kidding, really? Um, <laughs> so, the, so the idea behind it was, therefore, it's bad. Yeah. And so you have to be ready to you know, get ripped, and, and we do. And that's part of the deal. We are a small distillery. It is, we don't want to make things that taste like other people. Uh, other, what would be other the point? People. Yeah. And you got, that's exactly how we look at it. But at the same time, that means that some people aren't going to like what we do. That's okay. That's all right. right. Different strokes, different folks. Hey, yeah. uh, Todd, we have to wrap up. Cool. Our time has come to a close. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Thanks so much, Todd. Thank you so much for that. that was we may have to bring you back because we haven't really covered everything. So we may have to bring you back. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I would be delighted. You, uh, if you look at the distillery, you uh, received a set of your own personalized. Glenn I Cameron got them glasses. right before we went. We went on air, and that was very, very kind of you. To yeah, you make sure some of, but yeah, you right. make sure some of the uh, we'll spread that out to the production crew, and one one will go to my uh, my brother as well. But thank they you. They all have your name on them, though. That's all right. <laughs> So listen, thank you very much for, for letting me ramble. I know I probably talked too much, um, but 
as long um, as it's informative. Yeah, yeah. We, we really appreciate bad. you, and I hope that you all really enjoyed it and and kind of are, are seeing what it is I'm seeing in this in this whiskey. It's going to be a lot of fun getting this stuff out on the shelves and seeing. Well, yeah. seeing that's the important thing before we go because we're the clock is ticking. When is it available and where? Um, f I don't know. <laughs> um, oh, just TBD. My, my, well, my, my hope is January, but this is the COVID era and getting supplies and oh. labels and capsules is difficult. Mm -hmm. Our plan is January. I'll be sure to, to, to let you guys know. We, we don't do big releases and that kind of things um, uh, normally, uh, as you can, you can imagine. So this was just fun. And this is how, you know, to me at least, as small as we are, this is how marketing should be done. Let's get some folks together. Let's talk about these production processes and not send you an $80,000 box with an illustrated book because we can't afford that anyway. Um, Thank you. Thank right. you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but really appreciate your, your questions. And I'm sorry, if, especially to Liz, I kept talking over you. That wasn't intentional. That's all uh, right. Well, <laughs> Liz, Liz is there to be talked over. That's Do you want to know how good this was, Todd? We had no questions the whole time because everyone was listening. And now everyone is sending in oh. just, oh, wow, good. that was great. Wow, yeah. that was great. Yeah. This is really good. I can never, great I can, session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. Todd. All right, guys. And everybody. we uh, have next week, tune in. We have Rachel Berry. Yes. Uh, um, one of my heroes. Dr. Rachel Berry. <laughs> See, yeah. So, Master Blender for Brown. Um, it'll be a tough, tough one to follow up, but um, oh, tune in next shit. week. Listen. <laughs> You, you listen to her. She is she is one of my longtime heroes. I'm a great admirer of her work. She's brilliant. She she is going to crush me. So enjoy like her you. show. All right, Cheers, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. We'll see you Cheers, next guys. week, Dr. Rachel Berry. Bye bye. Cheers. See you next week. <laughs>